Welcome back, Anchor North. We're so glad to have you online with us today. Whether it's nighttime, good night, or if you're watching in the morning with us, good morning. Anyways, if you have time, we would love for you to go to our YouTube page, Anchor Church ABQ, and just like and subscribe to that channel. And make sure to hit the notification button as well. It's a little bell. And if you hit that, it'll give you a notification every time we post a video. Also, let us know that you're here. Write down beneath in the comments. Let us know that you're here, whether it's today or May 2022. We'll be right back with the sermon. is everything. I tell you, the perfect time can lead to the perfect scenario. A while back, during the football season, I was challenged to see how far I could throw the football between Adrian and Parker and I. It was wild. I wanted to toss that ball as far as I possibly could. I thought I might be able to throw it about 50 yards. So we measured, stepped out, and sent Adrian down the road. I wanted to take my phone out and put it on top of the car just to make sure that I didn't drop the phone or that it wouldn't impede me from throwing. Well, I tried to keep the phone safe. But about 20 minutes later, after throwing the football, we'll say at least 50 yards, I go, where's my phone? Have you guys seen my phone? I don't know where my phone is. <laughs> it dawned on me. It's still sitting on top of the hood of my wife's Jeep. I, in a panic, called her from Parker's phone, then called her from Adrian's phone, but she's not answering. She doesn't have their phone numbers saved. And like a true introvert would, she's not gonna answer a phone from an unknown number. And then I thought to myself, oh, I think the phone's on top of the car, and if I call my wife and the phone's still there, it'll click onto Bluetooth for her vehicle, and she'll see phone call from Parker on Jared's phone. <laughs> sure enough, it worked. She answered in the right time. I said, honey, I'm calling my phone, which is hooked up to your car, because my phone is literally sitting on top of the dash of the hood. She goes, oh, I see it. Oh, no. She slowed down and got in a safe place to save my phone. Perfect timing. If I would have called too late, I'm sure that that phone would have tumbled off and I would have been paying a significant bill to get that fixed. Well, today we want to talk about the perfection of God's timing and how it can lead, lead us to enjoy our lives. We want to talk about a God who comes in at just the right time. Look with me in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. Because when we can see this world through the lens of God's timing, it can provide so much enjoyment for us here on earth. Verse 9 says, What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in a man's hearts, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there's nothing better for them to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that anyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that Whatever God does endures forever, and nothing can be added to it, and what, nor can anything be taken from it. God has done it 
so that the people fear before him that which has already been, that which is to be, already has been. And God seeks that what has been driven away. Wow, the beauty of God's timing. We see the beauty of God's timing can move us from futility to great beauty. This passage of scripture is broken up into three different sections. And really, it's a continuation from last week. When we saw how there's a season for everything, now we're understanding those seasons rest within the sovereignty of God. And the beauty of God's timing is that you can move away from feudal living. You can leave futility behind. And you can embrace and step into the beauty of God's plan for your life. You can go from futility to beauty. Well, there's a saying that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And Solomon answers that there is actual beauty in the seasons of life that are given to us. He refers back to something that has happened in the past. He's already processed the futility of work and his toil underneath the sun. But there's been a shift, hasn't there? He's moved away from futility now towards purpose and meaning. He's discovering that there is great purpose in the different seasons of life. And one word is missing from this passage that we saw earlier. And that word was that he was left unhappy from his work. Now he's discovered that a life with God is full of joy. It's full of purpose. It's full of meaning. And that he's looking through these words now through that lens of understanding. Like he's discovered joy and meaning in life. And so when he asks, what is there to gain? He's using that Hebrew word, a feminine word, what is there that's an advantage? It's this noun that says, what can I profit or what can I gain? And it's only found in this book of Ecclesiastes. He's saying, what can I gain? What's a profit to me? What's something that's to my advantage from my work? And this is the idea of to work on or about anything. It's the concept of to work about anything or even upon anything anything. And he's now saying that there's a lot to gain. There's a lot to gain from your work when it's surrendered to the Lord, when it's surrendered to your God, when you say, God, all that I am, all that I hope to be, it's yours. So take my life and use it for your glory. Use it for your honor. You see, we oftentimes struggle with trusting in God's timing. But I like what Philip Ryken says in his book, Why Everything Matters. When it comes to trusting in God's timing for our work and the toil that we labor against and knowing and sensing that there's great beauty in the timing of God, doing it God's way instead of doing it our own way. Listen to what he says. He says, sometimes being in the right place at God's time instead of the wrong place at your own schedule, can even save your life. By way of example, a group of college students from Wheaton College was frustrated one morning when their sightseeing in London was delayed by slow breakfast. They thought that they were running late. But when they walked up to the subway station, they discovered that they had just missed an underground explosion. To give it another example, Riken writes, and he says, A friend from college was supposed to be at the top of the World Trade Center on 9-11, but a double booking forced his company to relocate the meeting. Oh man, the beauty of God's timing in our lives and what we work on or upon, what, what we've toiled after, the difference that it can make being in alignment with God's will and his plan for your life 
using your life for the glory of God versus stepping out and and trying to get your own way and doing it on your own and meeting your own deadlines and your own agendas that you've set up for yourself that sometimes they don't align with God's plans. There is great beauty in God's timing. We saw even just briefly last week the timing of salvation the beauty of God bringing his son, we highlighted. And I want us to read these verses again. We looked at Galatians 4, 4, but it says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And in Romans 5, 6, it says, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for us. Wow, the perfect beauty of God's timing in salvation if we can trust God with our eternity, our eternal destination, if we can trust God with the road to salvation, we should be able to trust him with maybe what we would consider even more mundane tasks here on earth. This word beauty that's described here is really about the correctness, the right time, the the beauty of God's right time. In the Old Testament, You know, it was used as a visual term oftentimes, referring to something that we can see as beautiful. It was described even of Job's daughters in Job 42, 15, as noting that they were the most beautiful girls in all of the land. But it's got a wider range of meaning. It can mean something that is good, but more importantly, something that is right. Something that is beautiful is something that is good, but it is what is right. It's pleasing and it's appropriate. When you look at something that God has done, you might be led to go, wow, that was beautiful. It was amazing how God worked. And you probably discover that in that moment, you'd say, I I wouldn't do it any other way. I wouldn't do it my way. Your understanding of God's ways being greater than your ways increases when you can recognize the beauty of God's timing. Because the beauty of God's timing is pushing all of heaven and earth towards eternity. I tell you, we were meant for eternity. We were not meant for this temporal life here on earth. We were meant for something more. I love that Switchfoot song. Pull it up later on your playlist and listen to it in light of today's message. In verse 11, part B of that verse, it says that he puts eternity into man's hearts yet so that he could not find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. This passage, this is telling us that our hearts are drawn for something bigger and grander than what the world has to offer. That we are, in fact, we're drawn to great and mighty things that happen here on earth. We, as much as we might either love or hate Tom Brady, we love the fact that Wow, someone has been able to accomplish so much, having seven Super Bowls, being known even by Joe Montana as the the greatest of all time, the GOAT as far as quarterbacks are concerned in the NFL. When we listen to some amazing music, it leaves us in awe, in wonder of their great talent and their ability. It reminds people like me and maybe even you why we should never try out for The Voice or American Idol. We'll leave that to the pros because we can recognize great beauty. We're drawn to it. It's just amazing to watch someone at the piano just play so fluidly, seamlessly, that they can take the song in their mind and in their heart and put it to those keys, bring joy to so many. We're drawn to greatness. I I personally love seeing beautiful scenes of sunsets and sunrises, great mountains and oceans, 
I, I'm drawn to that beauty because I think deep within me, there's a longing for something more, for, for, for greatness. And that longing cannot be fulfilled apart from God because that longing points us towards God. It points us towards eternity. When he says that we are made for eternity with eternity putting in our being placed in our hearts, it's the way of displaying and showing us that our hearts are drawn towards the big and the beautiful because they lead us to God. They lead us to praise God. They lead us to recognize what real and true beauty is. We weren't made for this earth. We can enjoy the things of this earth that God has given us, but they were placed here by God so that we might look towards him, that we might live for eternity. I I like what Dwayne Garrett says. He says, God has made us hybrids, so to speak, and that we're temporal, but we have an inner longing for eternity. We have a longing for God, for something more. We can step away from futility and we can rest in the beauty of God's timing and how he's orchestrating the things of this earth and he's orchestrating the events of this earth to put our attention upon him, to direct us towards him. Well, yes, there's beauty in God's timing And as Solomon evaluates his perceptions, his pursuits, his own plans, he determines that he can trust in God's timing, that what God is doing, what he's establishing here on earth, how he is at work, that it's meant to draw us to him. And we can find great peace in that. One of our church fathers, Augustine, says this. He says, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they can find peace in you. Well, there's a great gift that comes with the beauty of God's timing. There's a gift in God's timing. And that gift is that God's timing can move us away from futility towards enjoyment. This is how we ought to live in light of eternity, to enjoy the life that God has given us and the work that we do here on earth. Look again in verses 12 through 15 with me. And out of the ESV version, it says this, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and do good as long as they live. And verse 13 says, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in his toil. This is God's gift to man. Whoa, did you hear that? God's gift to man is that we should enjoy the fruit of our labor. My kids, we've got them doing chores. Oh yeah, we had kids so that yes, we could teach them about God. Yes, they could bring us great joy here on earth, but oh man, so that they could do some chores. Let's be honest. They're making more messes than mom and dad. And so it's only fair that they were to do some chores from time to time. And Every week, they've got their list of duties, list of chores that they've got to follow through on. And when they complete those chores, we have set up with the green light card. They get their own little debit card, and it's kind of like a savings account. Mom and dad put money in those cards accounts and on those cards, and they can adjust where they spend that money, where they save, and where they give. They could take those cards and use them at the Dollar Tree if they want. They could take them and use them online. They could combine Christmas money and and birthday money and, and, and buy what they would like with it. And I tell you, our kids love this concept. They really They don't look forward to doing their chores necessarily, but they look forward to the reward of their chores. They make plans for how they're going to spend their money. 
They, in fact, look forward to giving their money to the Lord. They have a section each month where they tithe, and we as a family do that. And and they give to the Lord a tenth of their income to show God that, hey, all of these resources he has given them, it's theirs, and they're grateful for it. And and, and that they want to use the other 90 for the glory of God and the enjoyment that he planned for them. They don't have any problems spending the other 90. They like to save for fun toys that they see or special events they want to do with a friend that they know mom and dad are not going to pay for. They enjoy cashing in on their hard work. And Solomon writes here a very important truth that I think each of us here today We need to know and understand, because some of us, we feel guilty for enjoying the life that God has given us. Uh, Sometimes we feel ashamed for having some nice things if the Lord has blessed us with our work and he's given us something, and, and, and we act as if we can't enjoy it, but we can. If we work for the glory of God, and then we spend for the glory of God, then there should be no problems enjoying what we're spending our money on. My friend Shim, he was having a hard time on my last mission trip to Kenya. He's our coordinator, our point person, and he's the one who sets us up with interpreters, transportation, food, and lodging. And many, many years ago, at the ground level, before Anchor had ever gone on a mission trip to Kenya, they were developing how to interface with missions teams coming from America. And Shim, he had a vision. He saw down the road many churches coming and how to house them, to transport them, to use interpreters to help make them more effective and to feed these families, and he created a business outside of the missions that were taking place to support the missionaries that were coming in. And who would we rather use? Would we rather use someone on the open market as a person to help us with transportation, or would we rather use someone like Shim, who we know and we trust? And so Shim put up his own finances. He took the risk. He developed a a system of drivers and vans to help us with transportation on our mission trips. And God has blessed him with that. He's blessed him with that, and, and now it's expanding. He does safaris and things like that for tourists. And there's some who are young, And they haven't put in the hard work, the time, or the risk. And I mean, Shim is quite a bit older than a 20-year-old, but he's full of life and young and vibrant, and he thinks young. But he's worked hard to get to where he is. And the disparity from someone like him versus someone living in the village or working the day-to-day where some people in, in Kenya, they make less than $2 a day, they have a hard time with that kind of success. and The last trip I was on with Shim, I said, Shim, brother, uh, people are going to lob accusations against you. They're going to have their own perceptions. But did you work for the glory of God? And has the Lord gifted you and given you the fruits of the toil of your work? And are you going to spend it for the glory of God to do more missions and to expand operations and and to enjoy your life with the family that God has given you, the sacrifices that have had to be made on the family end so that you could be successful in this regard? Are, Are you going to use that for the health of your family? Man, the book of Ecclesiastes tells us that we ought to enjoy the lives that God has given us. That that is a gift from God. That living in light of eternity should really strap our boots down on some simple principles. As 1 Thessalonians will tell us in verse 16, to be joyful. And we see here in verse 12, again, it tells us to do good. 
in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, James chapter 2, really verses 14 through 26, those verses confirm what's said here in verse 12, that we're to have a faith and it works that are matched for the glory of God, that we were created by God, that we're his workmanship, his handiwork to do good works, and that we ought to be thankful that we see here in verse 13. And if we're living a life that's joyful, that does good for the kingdom of God, and is grateful to God for his good gifts to us, we get to reap the reward of that. We get to enjoy the life that God has given us. You know, he's given us a ton of great gifts. He's given us spiritual gifts. He's given us the gifts of the fruit of the Spirit. He has given us personalities. He has given us abilities and talents. He's given us faith. He's given us wisdom. He's given us new mercies daily. We could go on and on and on. But one of the great gifts that God has given us is that we can really enjoy our lives. God's given us a lot of gifts. But one that we can really enjoy is the enjoyment that comes from our toil, from our work. Our work that is really being filtered through that concept of verses 12 and 13 of doing good, of rejoicing and being joyful and being thankful. So don't let anyone give you the stink eye or judge you from the outside for enjoying the life that God has given you. Because your life in Christ, your life in God, that's living for God, should lead others to see that you can enjoy that life. That God has given you the gift of enjoyment from your toil. Well, we've talked a lot about eternity and living in light of eternity. And a person who does not know God has no eternal destination on their mind. A person who does not know God is going to simply think that they stop existing. If there is no God and there is no afterlife in their mind, they think that this life is all that they are given. And so they will work very hard to try and get the very most out of and the best out of this short life that has been given to them. And it leads them to futility. That's a frustrating work. It's an unhappy work. And so verses 14 and 15, they move us. They move us now away from that kind of futility towards forever thinking. From forever and beyond. Because what we do that's done by God in and through us lasts forever. Because what God establishes, what he does endures forever. Verses 14 and 15 says this, I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it and nor nothing can be taken from it. God has done it so that the people fear before him. And verse 15 says, and that which is already has been and that which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Oh, I like that statement. I perceive what God does endures forever. I perceive and I see and I recognize that life is not futile, that there is more to this life than what's offered here on earth, and that what God establishes will endure through all of eternity. It will be made forever. I sense and see that there are three primary things that last forever. There's God himself, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, who was and is and who is to come. God lasts forever. People's souls, they last forever. People's souls will last into eternity either eternal damnation and separation from God or an eternity of fulfillment in worship of God. 
in his word. His word remains true. It lasts forever. And just as Isaiah would say, the flowers of the field, they'll fade away. But the word of the Lord remains and it lasts forever. Words written 800 or so years before Christ. And then the birth of Jesus, God incarnate here on earth, the Son of God and the Son of Man. The Word becoming flesh, as John 1 will tell us. The Logos, thousands of years ago. We're looking at almost now 3,000 years ago. The Word of the Lord continues to endure and will endure forever. So if God, His Word, and people's souls last forever, that is what we ought to set our lives upon. Achieving the goal of a life well lived in light of eternity. That we would worry about. And by worry, I mean that we'd be concerned about, that we wouldn't have anxiety over, but that we would have concerns about things that last into eternity. That we'd be concerned about God, his word, in people's souls, and that we would view the world and the world around us as an opportunity to, yes, enjoy life and experience things here on earth, but ultimately that we'd be looking for opportunities to lead people to the Lord, and that we'd be looking for opportunities to see God and his word proclaimed. You see, there's a sovereign God whose ultimate power rests and presides over eternity and everything within it. And that sovereign God He is acting and working actively and establishing things here on earth and allowing things to occur so that we might fear him, that we might know him, that we might respect him, that we might bring glory to him. The phrase, fear before him. It should lead us to recognize how great God is and that we're not that great. It should lead us to humble ourselves before him. It should lead us to trust him. It should lead us to follow him with all that we have in all that we are. See, when we fear God, it puts us in right alignment and understanding of who he is and how he's in control, and who we are, and how we are not in control. You see, what God is doing, he is doing in an attempt to reconcile us back to him, to make right the relationship with him. Verse 15 says, God seeks what has been driven away. And Philip Ryken says this, the language of seeking, it's so positive that it suggests that God is looking to redeem the past and not simply to render judgment or cast his judgment, but by his grace, he will recover and restore what seems from our vantage point to be lost forever. I mean, from our vantage point, how can we get to God? How can we make right the situation How can we restore the relationship? There's no amount of good that we could do to make up for the bad in our past. And God is the one who steps in and says, I know you can't, but I can and I will. I want to make right this relationship. I want to restore this relationship. And what God does in his restoration in his redeeming us, in his reconciling us back to himself and restoring the relationship that we severed, it will last forever, for all of eternity. Sin has led us 
to a broken relationship with God, but God is at work making right that relationship. He wants to take beauty from ashes. That's what Isaiah says. He wants to make beauty from ashes in Isaiah 61, 3. He says, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful, a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Look at that verse on the screen for a moment. Take a look at how he takes ashes and he makes beautiful headdresses. How he brings gladness instead of mourning, praise instead of a faint spirit that we might be called oaks of righteousness that are planted by God so that he'll be glorified. What he does, he establishes for all of eternity. And he is at work mending the broken relationship, making it right so that we can move away from those ashes and step into beauty. We can have the oil of gladness and not sorrow. Oh, we are so grateful to a God that we can trust in, a God that holds us secure a God that's redeemed what was broken in our lives. So my encouragement to you in this moment is, is trust in that. Let your hearts rest in that and start living for eternity now. You might consider one of three things today. Something that you need to let go of, something you need to lean in on, and something maybe you need to lead out on. In light of this message of God's timing and how he's orchestrating the events of this world and allowing things to happen within this world to draw us to himself, that he allows us to enjoy the work of our toil, that he puts all things here on earth, the beauty of the sunset and the mountains that are so majestic to draw us back to himself, the first thing we ought to do is let go. Let go of ourselves and what we're holding on to. Let go of yourself and simply live for God. Let go of your ways and live for his ways. Let go. What do you need to let go of that you're holding on to that doesn't match up with God and his word that is not living correctly in light of eternity? What are you trying to do on your own power and your own strength that you just got to let go. Let go of yourself and your way and live for God in his ways. Next, lean in. Last week, we talked about the importance of living in community, right? There's a time for everything and what a great way to live that out and practice the one another's in community groups, in small groups within Anchor Church. But today, I want to challenge you to lean in a little and discover the joy of serving God, of working for the kingdom of God. And there is probably no better way for you to really evaluate how you're living in light of eternity than how you're serving God in light of eternity. Maybe there's a place here at Anchor. You could go to anchorchurch.com backslash north serving and hit backslash serving, and you could find a spot to serve in at Anchor. Maybe in children's ministry that's ever growing and expanding, or student ministry, or set up or tear down, or music, or helping out with some function in the church, on a behind the scenes role. There's so many ways that you can serve and use your gifts for God's glory, and you'll feel the reward of that work. And lastly, lead out. Lead out. Take time to think about ways in your life where you can lead out and be an example of joyful living so that people, when they evaluate your life, and even when you go through the hard times, the difficult times, you can still cry out like Job did, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But I'm not going to let any circumstance here on earth rob me of my 
joy. Maybe this week you could lead out by being an example of joy. Scatter joy, as my friend Linda says. Scatter joy everywhere you go. Scatter the joy of the Lord and be a leader in living a life that is rejoicing in the Lord. Watch and see how God will use that for his glory and how people will turn to him in fear and respect and honor and reverence and they'll find themselves humbling themselves before a good God because of the life that you're living. Let's pray. Oh God, we want nothing more than to trust in your timing and your sovereignty here on earth, that you, in fact, are allowing things to take place. You are orchestrating events, that you are sovereign over this world and eternity, and that you do all of that, yes, for our good, but ultimately for your glory, so that those who don't know you might discover a relationship with you, and that may be drawn to you, and that they could respond in faith and experience the good life that you offer them. Lord, we know and we trust in your timing that you're moving at just the right time to bring reconciliation, to restore relationships, and to make things right, to fix what our sin has broken here on earth. We trust you in that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, after closing a sermon like that, my heart wants to rejoice in song. I invite you to worship with us. Sing out loud if you'd like or reflect on the words that will be played on the screen. But now is our time to worship. Join us. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection why should I gain from his reward I cannot give is
his wounds have paid my ransom.